and welcome to News Click. Over the last couple of weeks, the scientific community has joined the literary, artistic and filmmaking communities to protest against the rising intolerance and perceived assault on reason in India. Over 600 noted Indian scientists have issued three separate statements uh, rejecting what one of the statements calls the destructive, narrow view of India that seeks to dictate what people will wear, think and eat and who they will love. To discuss the reasons behind the issuance of these statements, we're joined by Dr. T. J. Raman, Professor at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences in Mumbai, who is also a signatory to one of these statements. Uh, thank you for joining us, Professor. Right. Now, scientists are usually not seen as political creatures in the same way that artists or authors might be. So why have so many noted scientists come together now to issue this statement? Uh, I mean, most mainstream media channels would ask you, where were you during the partition riots, the 84 riots, the Kashmir violence, the 90s, and so on. What is your response to this? Scientists do come out and speak on uh, occasion as a scientific community. They have done so before. One of the noted instances was during the Vajpayee government, when the government introduced under the ages of Dr. Murli Manohar Joshi, then Minister for Education, when they introduced uh, courses on astrology and Vedic mathematics in um, uh, university education, scientists mounted uh, a strong campaign of protest. So scientists do come out and speak. They have spoken out in the 80s on the significance of scientific temper. So it is not that they don't uh, speak. But scientists are also more careful than most communities, professional communities, of speaking on issues on which they as a community or a profession uh, are not directly involved, but are involved just like any other citizen or on areas where there are others who are more expert and who are more qualified to speak. So they would, uh, on an issue like partition, uh, if you go back that far, or even in the Sikh riots or things that happen subsequently, other such incidents, scientists, I am sure, and I have done so myself, so have I know a, a number of my colleagues, they will participate as citizens in all kinds of campaigns or other such activity that goes on around them. You know, there are uh, incidents that happen here, that happen there, but when you see the building up of a pattern, of a systematic uh, sort of spread, as we have seen, of uh, intolerance, of unreason, especially in the public sphere, and uh, unreason and uh, outright obscurantist statements uh, with regard to science, you know, misrepresenting our scientific past in this country. When such issues come, there is a tipping point after which, like any professional community, you would say thus far and no further. And at that point, I think you want to stand up and speak. In one of the statements, uh, in fact, the one which you have signed, you've referenced the killings of Muhammad Akhlaq in Dadri, as well as the three scholars who were killed in Maharashtra and Karnataka over the last year or so. Now, the government has basically put these down as law and order problems or has said that these are the responsibility of the relevant state governments and, you know, we are not in power in the state in these, in these particular states. You know, when incidents of this kind happen, it is obvious in an uh, immediate sense that uh, there is a law and order issue or an issue of policing or of the control of crime and the state government has to do its best, put its best foot forward and uh, act. But then if you miss the point that who are the forces, what is the kind of ideology that sets this kind of acts in motion, if you wish, then one is missing the point entirely. This is what you must focus on. So it is true that Dabolkar was uh, assassinated. The word is not murder, it is assassination. Uh, was assassinated during a Congress uh, uh, regime in Maharashtra. But the what is the kind of ideology, the mode of thinking that lets loose those forces 
that then uh, attack people like Dabolkar who will be eventually responsible for the act of violence is a legal issue. But where is the political and moral responsibility? It is those who let uh, create this kind of discourse in society, create this climate of intolerance and uh, hatred in some cases of violence. Now, the government seems anxious to brush off uh, all these protests um, which have happened in the last few months as disgruntled leftists or Congress supporters who are being denied the state patronage that they've been used to for so many decades. Professor M. S. Swaminathan, who was not an original signatory, but you know, gave his very powerful letter of support to the signature campaign, has served every government. There is no government in this country that he has not approached, irrespective of which political dispensation they belong to, to speak up for uh, the cause of farmers in the country. So similarly, you take uh, you know the former director of the Indian Institute of Science, Dr. Balram. You take uh, current serving directors of many institutions who have signed. Many of these people, I can assure you as one of the signatories, uh, we are not even uh, mutually aware of what exactly our voting inclinations are. We are not even, uh, it's uh, in that sense, very often in the scientific community, we are uh, politically speaking anonymous. But nevertheless, there is something that draws us together on this and we spoke up. And I may add that, you know, uh, it was not a campaign in the sense of uh, uh, three or four people forming a team, drumming up support. He just uh, went through the internet on its own and uh, when we reached about a hundred people, we said uh, we are going to release it. It was the spontaneity of the response to the original draft which then everybody agreed on and signed, was remarkable. Absolutely. Now, the right-wing attacks on and use of history is something that is well known. It's happened previously also. Now, the current narrative that they've been spreading in this context is that history has been controlled for the past many decades by left-wing historians or Marxist right writers, and they're now just doing a balancing job of cleaning up this sort of space. Given that science is often seen as objective and above politics, can a similar narrative be spun around the work of the scientific establishment in India? No, I think there are two issues here. Uh, one is uh, obviously those who try to uh, pull this uh, allegation of patronage, of being pro-Congress or Marxist-inspired, etc., are uh, on an especially weak footing when it comes to natural science because uh, it is obvious that our work does not have any political implication in any direct sense. There may be secondary political implications, that's a different matter. So we don't have any direct political implications. So in this case, I think the accusation again is uh, you know, not worthy of much uh, note. But with regard to historians, having said this, I think the point about uh, uh, what uh, uh, rouses the ire of this uh, uh, rightist, or should we say neo-rightist uh, forces, is this, uh, you know, their objection to a rational scientific study of history. They can't distinguish between the analyst school, the Marxist, the, you know, the variety of streams of thought in, uh, the, in history. So all they see is that the old way, which uh, was uh, rapidly discredited post-independence uh, uh, with the rise of, uh, even earlier, you know, with the rise of uh, to the influence of uh, historians like uh, D.D. Kosambi, who incidentally began as a mathematician, his career. So with, uh, with the uh, coming of uh, historians of that kind, the writing and the, the study and writing of history in our country acquired a far more uh, scientific, uh, reasoned basis. And it was not about 
past glories, it was not a hagiographic account of kings, it was not singing the glories of a mythical past, it was uh, rational, founded on evidence, argued closely with the uh, with a real conscious knowledge of what theoretical techniques you are applying and this obviously arouses the ire of those who would like to create a mythical past for their own immediate political gains in the present. Now, generally speaking, um, there are sort of two ways of looking at the linkages between science and society. I mean, so you have the use of science as a method of technical advancement or development and of course of inculcating what is referred to as a scientific temper in society. You've already referred to how our government has a relationship or how it's using uh, or not using science to spread a sort of, uh, you know, a, a non-rational temper in society, how this is rising. Uh, given that you've had many of the BJP's top functionaries, you know, with ri making ridiculous statements about India's past and so on, do you think such attempts to paint this sort of glorious past help spread the scientific temper in any way? Are more people likely to be interested in what was actually happening in our scientific discourse in, the, in, in historically because of these kind of statements? The point that you made about the fact that uh, science has an instrumental value. Here science means science and technology has an instrumental value. It is necessary for production. Uh, modern industrial societies need uh, scientific knowledge. You need a scientific and technological uh, uh, human resources. You need people trained in these things. So that is one part of it. The other part of it we know that the coming of science, the study of science, not automatically and this I must emphasize, not automatically, but if science has to really penetrate a society, it must also bring the culture of science with it. And the scientific culture, which is you may broadly, uh, which Nehru brilliantly called the scientific temper, is about applying a critical use of reason looking to evidence in order to understand both the natural and the social world. Like many years ago, there was this phenomenon of Ganesha drinking milk. Yeah? So in that context, even people, you know, the evidence was in front of you that uh, the Ganesha, obviously, you know, stones do not drink milk. So despite that, there is this sudden hesitation to use your critical faculty and say that is bogus. So I think uh, uh, this disconnect, mm -hmm. it is not true that they are totally disconnected because even if you train people to do science, in India we are very good at uh, learning science, mm -hmm. learning technology mm -hmm. and uh, applying it. If we are told what to do, we know what to do it. This is the whole basis of our uh, IT industries uh, outsourcing, you know, right. uh, getting contracts, etc. But our record on innovation is distinctly poor. And why is that? Because innovation is about doing new things, applying the critical faculty. Innovation cannot come by simply reading and learning what is in textbooks. So, the absence of a sufficient, uh, shall we say, a movement or a larger social transformation that pushes people, uh, you know, the population at large towards a critical view of all things, okay, that uh, is what holds us back from innovation. You know, when uh, high officials, like starting from the Prime Minister, talk of things like Ganesha and plastic surgery, you know, or, or make absurd claims about what was known or not known. It's an old story about how the Pushpak Viman is like a helicopter, all the stuff you've heard. So it really takes away from even the regular practice and understanding of science, doing it innovatively, it takes away from this. So, why is it that uh, Hindutva is interested in this, you know, in this kind of campaign? I think uh, their immediate, uh, their ultimate target is not so much science. 
after all, you know, they love the bomb. So, you know, it's not as if you say it's no to It's not technical us, progress. And it's not that, uh, uh, I'm sure all their leaders have their mobile phones right. and they, yeah. they, make, very, daddy, they right? make very good use of social yeah. media. So, it's not that they spurn technology. Yeah. But the idea is to instill in people that when you are told that these things are not to be questioned, then you, they must heed and obey. Where else, where better to begin than with things that are considered absolutely objective, namely natural science. So, but there, I, I don't think eventually the target is science. Eventually, the target is the way uh, on questions of gender, the role of women in society, the empowerment of women, the uh, sort of Marginalized uh, uh, upheaval generally. that it creates in a traditional patriarchal society, the role of caste. It is, the, it is on these issues that they really want people to heed and obey. So, I think that is why, you know, that the target in some sense uh, is science because uh, you attack what seems the most objective, you know. That is that's that's, one that's, reading of That is a really insightful way to look at the situation and, and a really good note to end this interview on. Thank you so much, Professor, for joining us. I am sure we will have you back again on NewsClick very soon. You are welcome.